number of years ago, my wife and I did some studies on the whole thing of insurance. Do you need uh, insurance as a Christian? All the different types of insurance that are out there and, and things. And you can watch those studies. I will link them at the end of this one. But um, my wife does an extensive amount of research. She's a lot of the things that I talk about. It's because I learned it from her. Um, she's a tremendous researcher. And one of the books that she got recently is this book right here. Um, about marine insurance very interesting and you don't aren't really going to understand the whole finance world and the banking scam and everything else until you can understand that, that how insurance fits into this whole thing because if you don't have god god can protect you god can replace things that you lose but if you don't have god on your side then you have to come up with some other way to do it and a good way to do it is to con people to pay for your mistakes, also known as insurance. <laughs> um, I'm going to get a bunch of people to pay into uh, policies and things like that so I can enrich myself and tell them that I'll cover them if an emergency happens. And in reality, I don't have enough money to cover everybody out there. And then you get all that money coming in, you invest it in the stock market, you put it over here, put it over there. It's all part of the scam, the international finance scam, banking the stock market type of stuff, and insurance. So let me show you some quotes from this book here. And again, this is this is not a book against insurance. Let me make that very plain. Um, my wife goes to original source documents. I try to do the same thing in my research. Uh, we don't go and say, I'm, I got a book from some patriot or something that hates the insurance industry, and then I just quote him, regurgitate what he's learned. No, we actually go to original source documents from the people that we're trying to expose. All right, so let me just preface with that. But I'm going to go to some quotes now in this, and I'll show you some interesting things. Okay, so here we have the book, Marine Insurance, Origins and Institutions, 1300 to 1850. All right, edited, edited by A. B. Leonard. All right, we're going to start out by going to page three first here and um, the first paragraph I'm going to read the first paragraph here okay these little book dark things that she puts in there <clears throat> introduction the nature and study of marine insurance in the words of a 21st century Lloyd's underwriter insurance is the mortar between the bricks of commerce so it keeps the whole system together in other words it provides conting contingent capital with, which is transformed into cash in times of crisis, allowing entrepreneurs and companies to trade with smaller quantities of conventional capital that are prudently necessary in their particular perilous trading environments. In so doing, insurance transforms many of the uncertainties of capitalism into fixed costs. Further, it does so remarkably efficiently, a fact confirmed by its surprising resilience and by the steadiness of its structure. As this volume shows, the basic instrument of premium-based marine insurance remained almost identical over the entire four-century period covered by the contributors uh, beginning about 400 years before Lloyd's emerged as a distinct branded insurance market in 1769. Lloyd's of London, in other words. That's what that's talking about, Lloyd's. Today, underwriters there uh, elsewhere in London and in the other marine insurance centers of the world traded a financial product which continues basically unchanged from that which was used centuries before right down to the wording of the contract called a policy okay in other words if it isn't broke don't fix it okay um, they've been doing this scam for a very long time and let me explain to you how this whole thing works I kind of said it earlier you come to me and I say I'll use it as banking and then flip it over to insurance here you come to me and you say I have $100 and I say, okay, I will take your $100 and I will keep it securely in my bank. Okay, it's here for you whenever you need it. I'm protecting your money in my bank. I watch you walk away. You walk out the door and I say, okay, let's go spend this money. Let me go out and see what I can use this money for. You come back in later in the day. You say, is my money still in there? Oh, sure. Yes. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Your money's safe with me. Nothing to worry about. Uh, unbeknownst to you, I spent it already gone 
but you see I have somebody else's $100 that I can give it to you if you ask for your $100 back. That's how the whole thing works. All right? Insurance is very similar to that. And again, you don't think of insurance as some kind of a financial money-making thing. Maybe some people don't. You just think, oh, you have to have it because to get this or to get that or whatever. Um, and what they're actually doing, by the way, when it talks about the thing of underwriting, if you go to get a mortgage, a insurance agent will come and actually assess what kind of risk you are. So it'd be like you coming up there and you're standing there without any clothes on and some guy comes up and says, um, let's see, it looks pretty strong or she looks pretty strong, look like they're in pretty good shape and they're poking you and everything else and put your arms up and, you know, and you're doing all the stuff and they're saying, yeah, we got a good slave here. All right. Got a good one on the block here. Who give me 20, 20, 20, 20, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. That's what they're doing. You don't even realize it. You don't even realize the fact that you have become a slave when you go before the bankers and you get their money. You become a mortgage-backed security. We're going to make you sign a death pledge, mortgage. Okay, that's what it means. And you're going to sign the death pledge, which puts you out there as a slave. And you can be traded between banks, your MBS, mortgage-backed security. And the insurance guys are behind you saying, okay, if Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, if you fail, we're going to you know, gauge the amount of risk that you might be. See, it's very demeaning. That's why you go to the bank and you go through all the process and everything else and they just rake you over the coals. I guess now they don't as much because they're so anxious to get you into the system that they just give you money even if you can't really ever make the payments. Um, because the system's falling and they're just trying to get liquidity you know, they need to have velocity of money. In other words, they need to be making trades and all this other stuff, taking your money that's rightfully yours and going and giving it to other people. And that's what they do. I mean, literally, I'll just tell you a little story to illustrate my point here. Um, years ago, many years ago, my brother-in-law had a Kawasaki something motorcycle, kind of like an older 1970s, like a KZ or something, and had the fairing on the front like a gold wing, you know, like a tour type of bus, bike, motorcycle. And it was having some issues. And he went to a mechanic and he said, you know, could you fix my bike? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, it's just probably the carburetor or some kind of thing. I don't know what it is. Maybe some of the timing's off or something. So the guy took it into his shop. Well, my brother-in-law went home. His wife, you know, my sister, uh, she drove in the car, followed him in the motorcycle. He dropped off the motorcycle at the shop, went home in the car. A week goes by. I wonder what's going on. Calls up the guy, you know, hey, working on my bike. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm working on your motorcycle. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am found a few things. I'm just kind of testing it. And, okay, well, you know, let me know when it's done, all right? I need that bike to go back and forth to work to save money. It's our second vehicle and the whole thing. Second week goes by. How's the bike going? Oh, yeah, you know, it's still, you know, waiting on a part to come in here and everything else. Third week uh, gets a call. Um, uh, you know, I kind of wrecked your motorcycle. Turned out that this, this mechanic had it fixed right away and he was riding my brother-in-law's motorcycle around without my brother-in-law knowing it. Ended up wrecking the motorcycle. So what's that have to do with banking? Well, very similar to what happened back in the Great Depression. The bankers were spending the people's money, putting it out there, and then the people came in and said, Stock market just crashed. I want my money out of your bank. And the bank went, uh, yeah, um, uh, about that. Uh, we actually don't have everybody's money. We spent it. Uh, and the crash that happened, um, <laughs> oops, uh, you, you kind of lost everything. Banking is a scam. Hmm. And they say, well, how could they do it? through the insurance. You just saw the quote there that said that uh, insurance is the mortar that holds the whole financial world together. The banking and the stock and, and all that other stuff, they have to have insurance. Let me show you some more quotes here in this book. Um, let me get to it here. All right, here we have page 
four. Where's the page number at? Right there. Page four. We'll start down here at policy language and go to, I'll just read here till I get to it, um, contractual language. Policy language has remained unchanged for so long precisely because of its ambiguity. Hmm. As will be shown in this volume, disputes were typically settled by disinterested merchants from within the trading community. Sometimes, inevitably, courts and other outside tribunals with diverse levels of competence were called in to pass judgment. Each decision made by the arbiters of the merchant community added a new layer to the accepted interpretation of the contract wording within that community. <laughs> Litigation outcomes also put, also put paid to questions of coverage, although future adherence to third-party interpretations of the contracting parties' intents as to the limits of coverage was sometimes rejected. Changing the words of the contract reopened the potential for dispute and was avoided by retaining uh, tested contractual language. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, you're laity. You don't understand what we, the clergy, understand of the scriptures and the church traditions and whatever else. And we can speak Latin so that you can understand what we're saying. Um, oh, you mean you're using basically witchcraft, uh, forming your own language to bend, shape, and change reality, right? That's what the real truth of the Catholic Church is. You say, what's that have to do with insurance? They use the same thing. They use contractual language to try to get you trapped into this whole thing. I mean, how often do you actually read the contract when you sign up to insurance? Did you read the entire contract when you signed up to go to the bank? Not many people do. Oh, here's the contract stating, you know, it's just basically, it's, you know, and they give you the basic little synopsis of the thing. Okay, just sign there. And then this contract over here is this and that, and you're just, you know, you just kind of go, Oh, you know, and you got your little bank pen there, you know, a nice little pen. Here, we'll give you a, you know, 50 cent pen so that we can steal your money from you. And you're just kind of, oh, uh, okay. Uh, and this contract's about the thing and you're thinking, okay, I don't really know what this is, but I'll just sign anyhow. You know, there was a famous video of uh, Joe Biden, you know, Sleepy Joe, and he put this contract before him and he looks at it and he's going, oh, what's this now? And Kamala Harris is behind him. She says, just sign it. <laughs> just sign it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You know, the, the president, the leader of America, supposedly, is, sees a contract. And he says, what is this? I don't know what this is. And the vice president, goon, uh, whore, you know, whatever there. She she looks and she goes, oh, just sign it. Just sign it. Don't worry about it. You don't need to know what it is. Oh, okay. Let me sign it. <laughs> but you know what? we've all been guilty of it, haven't we? How many of us have actually said, oh, hold on, I'm not signing anything until I actually read this. Oh, wait, what's this here? Hmm, I need to look at this. See, they get you in the contractual language. Why do you think a lot of these bills that come out, the Patriot Act and whatever else, just hundreds of thousands of pages and all this legalese and legal terminology and whatever? And, oh, uh, should we sign this into law? Come on, okay, you have 10 minutes. And the congressmen and senators are saying, you just handed me this document. I can't possibly read the whole thing in, a, in an hour or two or 10 minutes or something. What? We have to sign it. Vote on it. All in favor. You know, see, it's all part of the end times. It all leads up to the end times. It's the destruction of true civilized society. And they're doing it through the insurance scam and banking and all the other stuff. But insurance is what ties it all together. That's their protection. That's their safety net. And you have to understand that. That's why if you believe it, you know, I'm going to be safe by having lots of uh, insurance policies. I'll have insurance policies to cover everything. You're basically signing contracts with the, the devil's people. They're not going to keep you safe. All right. Uh, now we have page five, the next page over here. And uh, let's see here. Start at... Uh, right down here. Okay. All right, we'll go over the next page then. Okay, let me see here. Still, state authorities were generally supportive of the practice of marine insurance because it was recognized as an important catalyst of trade, which was respected by states as a lucrative source of revenue. Huh. 
The love of money is the root of all evil. As such, state tinkering with the operation of markets or enforcement mechanism, mechanisms tended to be carried out with the intention, at least, of improving the insurance market protectionist uh, measures notwithstanding. Um, yeah, okay. That's where I'm reading to on that page. So, again, they look and they see that it's very lucrative. Um, you get the politicians and they look at this thing and they're going, hmm, you know, there's some good money in this. Uh, maybe, you know, we can kind of just see our conscience a little bit here. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Go on to the next paragraph here. Let me find this quote. It starts out, uh, merchant insurers. Okay. Right here we go. Okay, it says... Merchant insurers as underwriters were known in England since at least the 17th century. Used their club good to make more secure the trade both of individuals and of the community despite commercial rivalries. In a theoretical perfect underwriting environment, all merchants would share in the losses of the community proportionally to the risks which they brought to its risk pool. In practice, when underwriting was profitable, some of the cost was defrayed but less low. Loss costs ultimately had to be covered. Insurance made um, paying more manageable. Okay. I'm just trying to see where I'm supposed to read to. All right. Sorry about that. I have to keep reading here. This club good nature of marine insurance provided the strengths of the underwriting system when it re remained within close communities of merchants. Again, if you don't understand who merchants are, read the Bible and you'll see that the merchants of the earth are dealing with Mystery Babylon um, and the merchants are identified in the book of James as being the Jewish people. Um, I did the whole study proving that, the fifth kingdom, the miry clay working with the iron. That's the fifth kingdom that we are currently in. But continuing, however, when the optimal size and nature of the group... Um, sharing the club good were exceeded, problems could and did emerge as in the example of the differing customs of European and Indian insurers. As insurers mar as insurance markets grew, the entry of new participants who may be cast as outsiders often upset customary balances that had been achieved within markets of insurance insurers trading the in instruments instrument as a club good since understanding of the status quo and expectations of outcomes may not be shared by newcomers. As Rossi argues, while a relatively low number of new players may be easily absorbed, the swift entry of a large number creates serious difficulties in the preservation of the system. The best way to maintain is to adopt dispute resolution mechanisms which preserve the cohesion of the weakened system. A theoretical conception of the division between established merchant insurers and another group of outsiders can be drawn from Braudel, who described a two-tiered system of commerce the lower tier he proposes comprises the market, market economy. It is characterized by routine transactions of transparent but com competitive exchange governed by a set of rules and which involve only the buyer, the seller, and sometimes an intermediary. Okay, and I'll stop there. That's, you know, right there. Um, again, it's very technical, and I understand that. But... What we're trying to see here is the fact that this thing goes back hundreds of years. And it's all part of this way of scamming you out of your money. Again, go back to the banking thing. I'm going to lend you money. So you want to pay $30,000 for a house. I will lend you $30,000, but you're going to pay me double. So your house didn't actually cost you $30,000, it cost you $60,000. And then you want to buy a, a car. It's going to cost you 5000 I realize these numbers are extremely low, but just to prove my point. The car is $5,000. You want to borrow 5000 I will let you borrow 5000 but you're going to pay me back 10000 So you see what happens. After a while, you're constantly trying to pay off that interest to the bank. But the bank knows that you can fall away and you may, can't make your payments. You'll, you know, be like a, a horse, a out there plowing the, in the field and the, the bank pushes you a little bit too hard and you pass out and fall over 
And so the bank says, hey, you know, if this guy doesn't work out, I need to know that I'm going to be covered here. And so the insurance guy says, oh, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. I'll cover you. You know, and that's how they work this whole thing out. That's how the, the scam works. The debt system would not work if it wasn't for insurance. Okay. That's why it's very important to understand that. Um, now let me find the next quote here. And I will read that. Okay. This is the next page, page seven. Merchant insurers underwriting uh, primarily to share risk are part of the nuts and bolts of the market economy. All right. Again, the market economy. <laughs> Everything is being marketed to you. Um, it's amazing uh, how much stuff, you know, that they, I mean, covetousness, which is idolatry the Bible warns about. How can you escape covetousness in this world? I mean, when there's just so much that's marketed to you. You know, you go onto YouTube and whatever else to watch a video here, and, and there's just so many things that they're marketing to you. And now that they're, they have all this thing of behavioral tracking and whatever else, you know, you do a Google search for red umbrella for outdoors in the summertime, and next thing you know, there's ads popping up while you're watching my videos or something. There's ads par popping up in the sidebar for red umbrellas for sale on Amazon or whatever. It's marketing. That's... I mean, we don't realize sometimes how far advanced the system is. You know, back in the past, you know, you would have, um, you go to some place or whatever else, and um, or you would be living, I'll say it this way, and if you wanted a red umbrella, you'd have to think about how to make the red umbrella yourself. There weren't just merchants out there offering red umbrellas or any other thing. Obviously, just using a red umbrella to prove my point, that statement. But now I'll go to page 27 of this marine insurance book. You know, and again, understand when I'm reading books from them, they're saying, they're explaining, yeah, this is how we take advantage of people. This is how we control people and whatever else. This is the system that we use. So they're saying it as they're telling the truth about what they do. But to them, it's just kind of a, you know, necessary evil that we need to do and you just kind of don't tell people this stuff and the average person doesn't read the fine print this is available to anybody but you know we know most people won't read it except for some nutball pe preacher that's trying to warn you all right so here we have page 27 and we're going to start out with um, uh, an alternative here and go down to Genoa down to there an alternative way to meet the growing demand for money driven by expanding trade, particularly long distance trade, was to increase the velocity of the circulation of money through the introduction of new credit instruments. Innovations in this area uh, were initially developed in northern Italy, especially in Tuscany and Genoa. Hmm. Credit instruments. Huh. In other words, we need to keep the scam going. So we can't wait for John to come walking in with his $100 bill and put it in our bank account so we can lend out that $100 bill to a whole bunch of other people. We can't wait for that. So what can we do? We'll offer credit. John doesn't have to have $100. We can go to Bill and Mary and uh, Ted and whoever else, and we can come along and say, here, $100. We'll give you $100. Do you have anything backing it? No, you're backing it. I am? Oh, sure, yeah. We'll have insurance there to cover just in case something doesn't uh, happen or whatever else. And, you know. <laughs> I mean, what a scam. <laughs> Complete, total scam. I mean, I can turn this into anything. You come to me and you say, brother, could you please take care of my car? Sure. Um, don't worry, I'll keep it safe. I'll put it in my garage. Everything will be safe. I mean, you wouldn't want it in my garage here because my garage is falling down at the office, but... <laughs> Proving a point, you drive away, and I take your car out. I'm doing burnouts with it, and and you know donuts and things and whatever else. And hey, anybody else want to borrow the car here? You want to have, go have some fun with it? 
And you call me up later at night and you say, How, how's my car doing? Great, great. What's, what's the sound of the tires squealing out there? Oh, never mind. That's just somebody, some teenagers out there, you know, destroying your car. <laughs> you say, well, there's no way I'd be for that. But you do it with banking. You see? And when you're paying into the insurance type of stuff, they're using your money to help prop up this system. That's the whole point of this video. Be very careful what you're doing. All right, page... 248 let's go here quick is this it yes it says there's old piece of paper by this policy of insurance okay and down here the caption it says Policy dated 17th of September, 1794, underwritten in the Boston office of broker Chardon Brooks on the schooner Nancy by five private underwriters, covering a return voyage from Boston to Baltimore for the rate of 4%. The printed clause, which would void the policy in case of war, has been struck out, ALC uncatalogued. So again, they're um, underwriting and things, uh, the creation of America. A lot of the early things that were going on with America, insured and whatever else, <laughs> tied back to the Bank of England and, and things like that. <laughs> I mean, very simple history lesson here. Who won the War of 1812? You know who? The banks. <clears throat> who won the War of Independence? The banks. You know who won the Civil War? The banks. Um, you know who won the Spanish Spanish American War? You guessed it. The banks. World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam War, uh, the first Desert Storm, then Operation Iraqi Freedom, the war in Afghanistan. The banks. The banks. The banks. You know who's going to win World War Three? The war in Ukraine. Um, war with between Israel and Iran. Uh, the war with America and China over Thailand or whatever. The banks. The banks. The banks. And the insurance will be there as the mortar to keep everything all held together. There are states here in America, brethren, that, that I learned, I think New Hampshire is one of the states that uh, you don't have to have vehicle insurance. Uh, you don't have to have health insurance or any kind of insurance. Uh, we might actually end up moving there someday. <laughs> I don't know. Because I can't stand this whole insurance industry. Um, and again, the stories. I've heard so many stories. I've known people personally that have major health issues and the insurance companies just, just drop them. They cover it for a little while and then they just say, okay, you're no longer insurable and whatever else you see, you're too big of a risk now and you're costing the insurance scam too much money. And... You know, see, it's it's all part of this whole scam of the end times. That's what you have to understand. Uh, literally knew a pastor many years ago. I was in ministry with, with him. Um, we'd go out door to door and things, and I, I knew him personally and everything. Went to his home. was in his office, I don't, his den. I don't know how many times talking about the Bible and ministry type of stuff and whatever else. Was, literally, I was going there when I started King James Video Ministries, Liberty Baptist Church. And there was a million dollar insurance policy on that man in case he said the wrong thing. What kind of an insurance policy do you think will be there to protect the Antichrist? Oh, no, brother. He won't be insured or any. Uh, come on. <laughs> um, I, can I can assure you that he will be very heavily insured. Very high insurance policy. And as I stated... Um, I've been many years uh, without an insurance, any kind of medical insurance or whatever else. And ironically, it actually makes me live more careful about my health. Back when I had medical insurance through uh, working at the Susquehanna Sante Boat Works, building pontoon boats after high school, I had insurance, good insurance, you know, I didn't care. I destroyed my appendix, had my, had my appendix removed, I'm going like, you know, pointing down here. I don't have an appendix anymore, I have an appendectomy and all that stuff. Uh, partly it was the toxic factory, but another part of it was just my toxic lifestyle. Just eating junk food and drinking poison pop, six cans of Dr. Pepper a day. 
is what I was drinking back then. Just eating, you know, I'd go to this candy store at the uh, Park City Center in Lancaster County, and I would get, there was a store called Help Yourself, and I'd get pounds of jelly beans, and they'd just sit there playing video games, eating jelly beans. Get sick as a dog, you know, feel terrible the next day. I'd get over it, and I'd go back to it again. I mean, just toxic lifestyle. Horrible. But I had health insurance, man. Who cares? Had a uh, 1991 Kawasaki ZX-11 Ninja and modified and everything, you know, stage three jet kit, muzzy, full muzzy header and exhaust. And, you know, there's motor work done to it. It was bored out a little bit and things. I mean, fast bike, stupidly fast bike. Could do 200 miles an hour. I only had it up to 175 miles an hour, but I didn't care. I had insurance. Who cares? <laughs> um, right now, I don't have any insurance on anything I own. None. I have minimum coverage on my vehicles. If I have an accident, it only covers the other guy. It doesn't cover me. This office here, there's no insurance at all, um, except for God. God is my insurance policy. God protects me. God provides for me. So I'm going to end this video here. I'm going to put the links to the other videos here. You can see about the thing of the insurance scam. Should Christians have insurance and whatever else? And uh, I hope I've challenged you. Okay, um, You can save a lot of money if you get away from the world system. And uh, me personally, I don't want anything to do with the whole banking industry and whatever else. I have a bank account. You have to have it to pay bills, but I keep very little money in there. Um, and not a big fan of the whole banking thing. So that will be it. Check out these two videos. Thank you for watching.